Page 15, number 71. According to the hinge theorem, fill in the blank. We're comparing the measure of angle 1 to the measure of angle 2. Your options are equal, less than, or greater than. Now, the hinge theorem is also known as the SAS inequality theorem. Which means that if you have two side lengths that are congruent, which in this case we do, we have one pair of sides between the two triangles, and then the second pair of sides with a single tick mark. So if you have two pairs of sides congruent, the angle between them will determine which side length between the two triangles is longer. So taking a look at angle one and angle two, we have 30 and 29 as a side length across from those angles. Since 30 is larger than 29, that must mean that angle one is larger than angle two. So you're comparing what is across from those angles. So again, 30 is larger than 29. So 30 is across from angle one. So although we don't know the measure of angle one, we know that angle one is a larger angle in measure than angle two. So I'm gonna put in that angle one is larger than angle two, which is choice C. Now the next question has to do with the same hinge theorem. So let's take a look. Number 72, apply the hinge theorem and find the range of values for z. Now again, take a look. We're going to look at which two pairs of side lengths we have congruent, and we're going to highlight them. So my first pair of sides is the single tick here and here. My second pair of sides is the double tick here and here. And now the angles in between them, we notice one of them is 65 degrees and the other one is 54. I always like to focus in on the larger angle. So 65 is my larger angle. That means the side across from it is going to be longer than the side across from the 54. So 16 is longer than the side length of 4z minus 12. Now this isn't going to give me a range, it's just going to tell me what z is larger or less than. However, to create a range, we have to have a lower boundary. Now think about the constraints for a side length. 4z minus 12, it can't be so small that your side length disappears. So it could be less than 16, it could be 15, it could be 14, it could be 13, but your side length can never be zero or less than zero. So we have to put a lower boundary constraint on 4z minus 12 by saying that it's going to be larger than zero. Because if it's zero, then you no longer have a side length. So we want 4z minus 12 to be a larger side length than the length of zero. Now this, you can go ahead and solve. We're going to break both sides of this inequality into two parts. So for the left, I'm going to say that 16 is greater than 4z minus 12. 16 is greater than 4z minus 12. And for the right side, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to say that 4z minus 12 still needs to be larger than 0. So for the right side, I'm going to say 4z minus 12 is larger than 0. I'm going to solve these separately, and I'll be able to figure out my range of values. So for the left side, solve it like a normal equation. Add 12 to both sides. So we're going to get 28 is larger than 4z. Divide both sides by 4, and we're going to get that 7 is larger than z. So 7 is going to be our upper boundary. Z can have any value less than 7, and our side length will still be less than the side length of 16. Solving the right side here, again, we're going to add 12 to both sides. So we're going to have 4Z is greater than 12. 
divide both sides by 4. So z is going to be larger than 3. So as long as your z value is larger than 3, your side length will be larger than 0. Put these two together, and our final answer is 7 for your upper boundary, 3 for your lower boundary. Th so the range for z is anything between 7 and 3. It can't be 7, and it can't be 3. So this is an application of the hinge theorem. Okay, let's move on. Number 73. Two sides of a triangle have side lengths of 3 inches and 7 inches. What is the range of possible values for your third side? The range of possible values for a third side of a triangle. Now this is a pretty quick and easy type of question. To figure out the range or the upper boundary, let's start there. To figure out the upper boundary, you're going to take the two side lengths that you know, which are 3 and 7, and you're going to add them together. You're going to take the sum. So 3 and 7 added together gives you 10. So 10 is the upper boundary for the third side length. To figure out the lower boundary, you're going to subtract 7 minus 3. 7 minus 3 is 4. So your third side length can be anywhere between 10 inches and 4 inches. It can't be 10 inches and it can't be 4 inches, but it could be anything in between. So whenever you're asked to find the range of values for the third side, add and subtract, and those will be your boundaries. Okay, moving on to number 74. Number 74. Identify the method to prove the triangle's congruent from the information provided in the diagram. So we're proving that triangles are congruent. Now the methods for proving triangles congruent are SSS, SAS, ASA, AAS, and lastly, there's something known as HL, hypotenuse leg, but that's only used if you have right triangles. It doesn't have to be what you use if it's a right triangle, but it's only an option if they're both right triangles that you're trying to prove congruent. Now let's go back to the question. Let's see what they gave us as information. Now we notice we have a pair of congruent sides, AB and CD. So that's one pair of sides. I'm going to put a little S there. Now the next thing that I notice is they share a side. So they share CB, which is known as your reflexive side the reflexive property. And the reflexive property says that CB will be congruent to CB when you separate out these two triangles. That's going to be another pair of sides that are going to be congruent. So I'm going to put another S next to CB. And lastly, I don't have any angles and I don't have any other side lengths. But if I pay attention to the markings in the diagram, I notice that there is a parallel symbol for the top and bottom. When I have things that are parallel, I like to look for either the same side interior angles or the Z. So if you remember before, we've talked about the Z. So looking for the Z lets you find alternate interior angles that are congruent. So I do see a, a Z here, starting at A, going to B, down to C, and over to D. Whatever falls in the corner of that Z are going to be congruent angles. So I'll notice that angle B, that's one corner of my Z, and that at angle C, that's the second corner of the Z. So those two angles are congruent. So now I have an A, a pair of angles, because I notice what the parallel lines are telling me. Now look at what we have. We have two pairs of sides and a pair of angles. So looking through your choices, it's not going to be angle, side, angle. That requires two pairs of angles. We only have one. Second choice is side angle side. That's definitely possible and we'll talk about it. C says three sets of sides congruent. Well, I only have one. I don't have the third pair, so it's not going to be C. HL is not an option because these are not right triangles. And lastly, AAS requires that I have two pairs of angles. And I don't have two pairs. I only have one pair. So I'm going to cross off AAS. Now I'm going to have to assume that it's going to be side angle side. But look at your diagram. The SAS theorem says that pair of angles has to be between 
the pair of sides that are congruent. In other words, if this is one pair of sides, this is the second pair of sides, the angle is between them. So this is an S, this is an S, the angle is between them. And that's exactly what we see here. Our congruent angles are between the sides that we have now seen are congruent. So I'm happy with choice B. Let's move on. Number 75, identify the method to prove the triangles congruent from the information provided by the diagram. Okay, so again, we're proving triangles congruent. So we have to look at what markings we have. Now notice the side down the middle that they share, the reflexive side, is already marked for us as congruent. So that's one pair of S's right there. Okay, next, I also see angle T and angle V are congruent. So that's a pair of angles. So I'm going to put an A at angle V. And lastly, I see that there are right angles, that the fact that they're perpendicular. So that means that there's a second pair of angles congruent. Now, I have two angles and a pair of sides. Now, notice how the information appears. The side is not between the angles. Notice that this side length, UV, is not the side that's congruent. So that means that I do not want to use angle side angle. Because notice where the S appears. It between, it's between the two pairs of angles. And in our diagram, UV is not the side that they told us is congruent. So I'm not going to use ASA. But we do have one other theorem that uses two pairs of angles and a side. A, A, S. Let me cross this one out. A, A, S says the side length that's congruent is only touching one of your angles. So notice this yellow side length where we have our S is only touching the right angle, the one pair of A's. The second pair at angle V it's not touching that angle. So I like AAS as a choice, which is choice E. Let's move on. Number 76. In the diagram shown, B is the midpoint of both line segment AE and of line segment DC. So think about what a midpoint does. It splits your line segment into two congruent parts. So I'm going to look for B in the diagram. I notice it's right here. So it's splitting AE into two congruent parts. So I'm going to go ahead, one tick mark on AB, one tick mark on BE. So to the left and to the right, it's congruent. It's also splitting DC into two equal parts. So to the left of B is DB and to the right of B is BC. So what I just got were two pairs of sides out of knowing that B is the midpoint for both of these lengths. Now it says identify the method to prove the triangles congruent. So again, we're using all of our congruence theorems from the information provided by the given statements. So I've only been given two pairs of sides according to the information provided. However, I do notice that we have line segment AE and CD intersecting, which means at B, we have vertical angles. Vertical angles. And whenever we see vertical angles, we know that vertical angles are congruent. So the left and the right angles here are congruent. So I do have a pair of angles. And notice where it appears. It appears between the two side lengths that are congruent. So our angles between the two side lengths. So A, our angle, is between the two S's. So my theorem is S, A, S, because it's between the two pair of sides that are congruent. So I'm going to select choice B. And that completes page 15. Let's keep it moving.